further uh, commanditizing the registry. Uh, name's Richard Sidaway, I'm PowerShell MVP, uh, director of PowerShell.org. I've done a bunch of the organization for this, so anything that you really like, please come tell me. Anything that, about the summit that you don't like, go and see Don. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, the registry is a thing that every time you pick up a book and it says you're going to touch the registry, uh, beware, if things go wrong, you've trashed your machine, uh, it's a fairly vital part of a Windows setup. And working with it is not necessarily the easiest of things to do. PowerShell gives us the provider. Uh, everybody use that, the PowerShell <coughs> provider? You've got a WMI class, STD RegProv, which has some interesting quirks, as we'll see in a while. And you've got a .NET class, a couple of .NET classes for working with it. Uh, anybody use those? Yeah. If you looked at the scripting games solutions over the years, there's quite a few there's usually a question about playing with the registry, and you always find somebody <coughs> will go down the .NET route, which always causes a grin when I see it, because it's about three times the work, but never mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly brush over the provider and the .NET solutions, and I'm going to concentrate on the WMI solution. Um, if anybody's read my WMI book or read anything that I've written over the years, you'll know that I play with WMI quite a lot, and it's one of those technologies that you either love or hate, and I do both. <laughs> so the registry provider, our WMI is it's fantastic, but the documentation is so awful, it's just not true. So the registry provider, you've, all, you've probably all used it. It's one of the classic demos when people start demonstrating PowerShell. Oh, look, I can do a DIR through the registry. Cool. It's great for working locally. Uh, you can use the standard commandlets, all of the uh, item commandlets and the item property commandlets. And it exposes the local machine and current user hives as specific drives and at that point people go well what about the rest of it well actually you can get to the rest of it if you've not seen this trick if you do microsoft.powershell.core slash registry double colon you see it all and then you can play with it um, with a standard path and so on and so on the big drawback as I said with the provider is that it's only good for the local machine. If you want to work remotely, you're a bit stuck. Um, I suppose you could go through a remote session and then that, but that starts to get messy. So we come to WMI and the standard RegPro. You all use this? Anybody not used it? It's an interesting class for values of interesting. Um, in Windows 2008 and later, which given that 2003 and XP have supposedly disappeared because it's no longer supported, should be everything, uh, you'll find it in the root CMV2 namespace, which um, is the default WMI namespace that PowerShell will attack or use, I suppose would be a better phrase. And you'll also find it in the root slash default namespace uh, for backward compatibility. It's a little bit odd as a class because if you just try to use it, you get nothing back because it's all methods. There's no properties returned on it. There's just a whole bunch of static methods. Now, do you all know what a static method is? Yeah? Okay, there's somebody nodding. Anybody want to tell us what it is? <laughs> <laughs> All right. A static method is one where you don't need to create an instance of the class. 
So if you think of Win32 underscore process, you can create an instance of the, and um, you're running Notepad, you can create an instance of the class for that Notepad process, and then you can use the terminate method to kill it. With the reg provider, you don't need to create an instance of the class before you use the methods. That's what it means by static methods. It suppose it just makes it easier, but unless you've got your mindset around what a static method is, it just gets a little bit more complicated until you've seen somebody step through it for you. So it gives us methods for working with keys and values. You all know what a registry key and a, the difference between a registry key and a registry value. Yeah. So the, the key is the, the path, the value is the actual bit at the end that you're actually working with. Notice how the terminology <coughs> changes and the machine stops working. You can work with numeric values, so you can work with D words and Q words. You know the difference between these? 32 bit, 64 bit. Is that right? Yeah. You can work with strings, so you can get and set string values. You've got multi strings, which are multi valued strings. And the expanded string is where you give it an environmental variable and it does the expansion for you. All standard stuff for working with the registry. And if you're really, really feeling brave, you can play with the binary values. Anybody does that? Yay! <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> uh, you've got some security methods. I'm not going to go through these because they use bit masks for permissions and it just does not really work with what I'm doing here. Uh, there's a bunch of techniques in Chapter 7 of PowerShell and WMI, which is a nice cheap um, advert for it. If you've not read it and you want to play with WMI, I do recommend it. I spent a lot of work on that. Please read it. Uh, you've also got some security methods. You can check your access, which gives your permissions only, and you can set the security descriptor and get it. So all of the stuff that you can do manually through the regedit, you can do through the WMI class. Now, was anybody working with PowerShell 1 that's in the room? Yay! So, with, if you remember back that far, you only had the getWMI object class. It was the only, so commandlet, it was the only commandlet that you had that you could work with remote machines. So what you had to do was create a variable that pointed to the hive, and that's what this thing does. It stores it as that wonderful number. Um, there will be a test, you will be expected to remember that. <laughs> uh, you give it the key, which is normally referred to as the sub key for some bizarre reason, and you give it the value you want to play with. You then use the WMI class accelerator, uh, which creates, I was going to say it creates an instance of the class, but in this case it doesn't actually do that, it just gives you a pointer to the class, and then you can call the method from that. And that worked, and it worked fine. Um, then we got PowerShell 2 with invoke WMI method, and everybody went, yay, this makes life much, much easier because you can just call the method name, give it the arguments, and off you go. As we see when we get round to the demo, WMI method has a bug in it. Has anybody tripped over it? I'll sh demo it when we get there, but if you look at the documentation for the WMI classes, it will give you the list of arguments. If you try to use them in that order in the documentation and it's not in alphabetical order, it will fail. It's expecting the, met the ar method arguments in alphabetical order uh, as the .NET classes report it. It's a bizarre thing that's just always been in there. And then we've got PowerShell 3 and the sim commandlets. <coughs> Quick question, how many of you in 
the SIM commandlets rather than the WMI commandlets. Yeah, I would really recommend you switch to the SIM commandlets if you possibly can. Um, the SIM sessions make remoting so much easier for them and they are just so much nicer. You know, with things like uh, Win32 operating system where you get the last boot time and you have to do that convert to date time. Yeah, you don't do that with the SIM commandlets, it does it for you. There's a couple of quirks with them as well, but um, nothing's for free. Or, if you don't want to do any of that, when we get to the, the guts of the talk, you can use CDXML. Has anybody played around with CDXML? That's the usual response. Basically, what you do is you take a SIM class, and I'll be using SIM and WMI inter interchangeably. They are the same thing. So SIM is the common information model. That's the original definition from the Desktop Management Task Force. <coughs> WMI is Microsoft's implementation of SIM. And then with the new SIM commandlets, they went back to SIM. So what you do is you take the SIM class definition, you use that information, wrap it in some XML, at which point everybody starts running for the door, and you publish it as a module. And it works exactly like any other PowerShell module. If you've got it on your module path, it will auto-load with PowerShell 3 and above, and you can import it, you can remove it, all of the standard things. The reason that I like doing this talk is because Microsoft are using this technology a lot for a large number of the modules that they're producing. So if you look at Windows 8 with PowerShell 3 and compare that with PowerShell 3 that you put on Windows 7, you'll see that there's a lot of modules that you get on Windows 8 that you don't get on Windows 7. Anybody notice that? Yeah. The reason is because those are the CDXML modules that can't go onto Windows 7 because the WMI classes don't exist on Windows 7. You see the same thing in the server versions as well. So a whole bunch of the networking modules that they've written are all CDXML. The DNS server module is CDXML. And uh, there's a, you can, a whole bunch of them. So if you load something like the networking uh, modules and then do um, get module hyphen all, you'll actually see that it changes from a manifest module to a sim module. So any, if you do that and, and just load anything that's a sim module will be a, a CDXML module. CDXML stands for Command Line Definition XML. You get a lot of the parameter validation. You, how many have not written an advanced function and used the things like the parameter validation? Yeah, you, you know all, all of this stuff that you can decorate the parameters with in your advanced functions to validate your input uh, information. You can get all of that available. You work on the pipeline, you can have parameter sets, you get jobs, you get sim sessions, um, all for free. You don't have to do any work to set those up. A couple of um, issues to help. You can't have uh, common based help. It's got to be an external uh, file, which is a joy to write. As anybody will know that's done it. Um, you get sim sessions, but the class must be on the remote machine. The other useful thing for this sort of technology is Jeffrey mentioned that um, the DSC for switches and the network switch commandlets, again, that's a CD, CD XML module because it's wrapping the classes that are on the OMI for the, for the switches. You can also do the same running against Linux, which I haven't got as a demo, but I might... Uh, Is that how the OData stuff works? No. Sorry. Yes and no. Okay. 
So, quick diversion. OData, there's two separate strands to OData in PowerShell at the moment. There's the OData IIS extensions, which frankly is broken, um, and they, they need to sort something out with that because the examples just do not work. Uh, if anybody's tried it and got very frustrated, <coughs> join the club. There's the export OData endpoint proxy or whatever it's called. That works brilliantly. And that uses the same commandlet over objects technology to basically take the OData information and create a bunch of commandlets from it. And I've played with that, I've experimented with that. It's only in PowerShell 5. Um, but it is it is solid and it works really nice. Uh, where are we? Sim sessions. Yeah, if if you're using the sim commandlets and you're going back to the machine multiple times, use a sim session rather than uh, repeated calls. Sim commandlets work over WS man, which is um, much better protocol than DCOM, and you get the ability to use jobs. .NET, you've got a couple of classes, win32.registry, win32.registry key. I'm going to say absolutely nothing else besides them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, .NET, yeah. Uh, reference, the Hive constants, I've put on the slide just because you need it if you want to play around with this stuff. And it's worth uh, having somewhere. Registry data types, comparing it to standards. And... PowerShell in practice, PowerShell WMI, we covered a lot of this, and PowerShell in depth, we covered some of it. Actually, that's the reference for the first edition. It should be Jones 3 or 4 now, but you'll find it on the Manning site. And I think that's the, it for the slides. So let's have a look at some code, because it's always more fun looking at code. So. Could you move your window? <coughs> Could I, what, sorry? Move the window. Oh, move the window. That better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. <coughs> okay, so if you look at std regprov, you've got no properties, you've got a bunch of methods. It's in root default. Um, I wouldn't bother with that one anymore. Um, uh, you've got the methods that I showed you on the slides, and uh, they're all fairly explanatory from the names, and they're all st static. The re you all understand WMI return types. You get an integer return. Uh, if it's zero, you're good, it's worked. If you get any other number, you've got a problem. And good luck trying to trace that because the documentation doesn't exist. It's guesswork. And you can drill down uh, into seeing the parameters. The parameters are fairly <coughs> standard across these methods. So H def key is the um, the hive, and that's that great big long number. You can either have it as a decimal number like that, or there's a hex version you can use if you prefer. Uh, you've got a subkey name, a value name, and a value. Um, that's usually your lot. And those are the numbers. They're also on the slides, and you can see the hex versions there. Which, when you see the hex versions, the actual numbers <coughs> make it a little bit more sense. I've always found it easier to define them as a variable. The important thing to notice is that it's an unsigned integer. It's not a standard integer. Um, the classic error that I'll make at quarter to 10 at night when I'm trying to do this in a hurry is use an integer and then swear when it doesn't work and wonder what on earth is going on. Uh, the subkey is a string, the value is a string, and there you go. So let's just, for completeness sake, I'll show you the WMI class um, method from PowerShell 1. 
and you can see that it's created it's got an instance of the class or a connection to the class I should say probably better and you can notice the convert from date time convert to date time that they uh, team add for you you can then use the the class and the method and you get a return value of zero means we, it's actually worked and you get the value all good and you can do the usual selects and whatnots with it or you can do it that way if you prefer to write it that way whichever works for you it's one of the nice things about PowerShell doesn't matter how you want to do it um, you can make it work for you right quick question wake you all up year and month the PowerShell one was released 2006 the month I don't know anymore. 2006 is correct for the year anybody want no. to take a guess at the month October. who said October September June. You're guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Who said October? That's it. You're the nearest. <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks. It was November. It was released at TechEd Europe in, in Barcelona in November 2006. Uh, then we got PowerShell v2 with the invoke WI method. And just showed you on the slide. That makes life easier because you can just chuck the arguments at the method. Again, you're getting a return value of zero. Uh, and as I said, I'm just gonna go through this quickly. I'll give you this, the code and you can play around with it. But if you create a key and give it a value and you can and then get that. Now try and modify it. seems to have worked oh dude that's what I was meaning about things going wrong remember I tried to modify it and it hasn't changed that's because the uh, methods are in the wrong order the sorry the method arguments are in the wrong order the common this normally um, actually aborts on you and gives you a big red me error message because normally you've used a different um, data type and it just goes, blah, not playing. So the best way to test what order you should put the arguments in for um, invoke WI method is to use the get sim class, which is the best way for finding out how a WMI class works. Because it shows you what's actually on the box, because the documentation, if it exists, isn't necessarily up to date. You can pull the properties apart, you can pull the methods apart, you can see what's actually happening. And if you retry it in that, it should have worked, yeah. <clears throat> and the sim commandlets, just a variation on a theme. The nice thing with the sim commandlets is that goes away because you have to give a hash table of the parameter name and its value, or values. And that works. These really are fine if you know what you're doing, but it's not the sort of stuff that you can give to a junior admin and say, go and play with the registry. Well, you can, but you'll be revising your CV and looking for a new job shortly afterwards. <coughs> so, what Ideally, you want is something like this, and this this is the final endpoint that we'll work through to. So, I got I created a module. You should be able to recognise these things. You got gets, you got new, you got removes, you got sets, all the sorts of stuff that you want to do. If you notice, the command type is reported as a function. It's standard for a script module as well. There's some stuff put into get command in PowerShell 3, <coughs> I think it was, 
that actually unravels what's going on with a lot of these things and works it out for you. If you use um, get, get module uh, registry hyphen all, you'll actually see that it's reported as sim module, like I said. And then all you do is get registry string, give it a hive, sub key values, black, off you go. That for a junior admin who's just learning PowerShell is a lot easier for them to get their heads around than playing with the WMI class. Which is one of the reasons why Microsoft have created all of the modules from the new SIM classes that they're introducing for managing the things like DNS. Because also they can use those from other tools and they get maximum value from it. And you can set registry strings and then pull it back and we'll get rid of that just to keep it clean okay so let's have a look at how we get around to creating that <coughs> i'm going to start with a very simple one just to show you the what the xml looks like and one of the simplest classes going is the Win32 underscore bias class. It, again, is another class that features quite often in the scripting games because it's quite safe because all it does is read stuff and it's one that's fairly easy to discover. And it gives you, a, the command load gives you the exact same output as you get from get sim instance because it's returning the same sort of object, so it's using the same formatting file. Yeah. And you can, as with the sim command list, you can use format list to drill down and see all of the rest of the data. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the syntax, as I said, you get a sim session, you get a throttle limit, and you get the ability to run it as a job. And that's running over a sim session. Now, let's show you how that actually works. And that's it. That's not too scary, is it? <clears throat> Nobody answering? <laughs> so, you've got a couple of lines of headers. First one is just standard. The second one is telling it to use the Microsoft Command Over Object Schema. The class name. So you've got the namespace root simv2, win32 underscore bios as the class name. You give it a version. Um, everybody version their modules. You can do that in the uh, manifest file. You give it a default noun. That's entirely up to you. The version is arbitrary as well. Uh, make that up as you go along. This is the bit that does the work, where it says instance commandlets. And it's just telling it that it uses the default parameter set, which there aren't any parameters, so it just does it. That produces the get BIOS commandlet that you saw. All of the magic that actually makes it work happens with the commandlet over objects technology in the back. What it actually does is when you import the module, it reads the XML, and the commandlet over objects technology converts that into a PowerShell function that sits in your function drive and it's miles of code but it actually works. And I've lost the mouse. Where's my mouse gone? Yeah. Uh, I've actually got some code from a session I did in 2012 at the PowerShell Deep Dive in San Diego that will be available with a download. I think that was working with disks to give you another example. Okay, so that's the basis of it. When we get to using the reg provider, it gets a little bit more difficult, but not massively. So we'll start to look at that. And if 
we look at that code, so you should recognize the top stuff. Um, the only bits that's changed is that change the class, change the default noun. Uh, again, that's arbitrary. I've used registry just to make it obvious. You can call it whatever you want. So you're defining the verb and the noun. In con the impact, you know, the, the confirm parameter that comes up, uh, set that. You're setting the method name that you're going to be using. <coughs> PS type for the return value, and then you set in the parameters that you're going to use. So this is where it gets a tiny bit interesting, and there's a good opportunity for getting things wrong. Is if you remember back to when we we're looking at get sim class, the parameter is actually edge def key. You can actually override that and give it your own name. Get those two the right way around. <laughs> That's another good uh, error to try and trace late at night. And then you can just step through the rest of the parameters. There was a designer tool for doing this uh, that was produced back in the PowerShell 3 days. It's not been touched for a number of years and it's broken. So. Unfortunately, you're back to cut and paste, and um, there's not a lot we can do about that. But it's not difficult XML, and it's all standardized, and it all follows the same sort of pattern, and it's quite easy to use, and there's not much that you have to do with it. And then you just close down the XML. Uh, I've just gone through all of that, so we'll just skip through that. And use it, we'll just define the variables again. Put <clears throat> module. I've got these off in a um, separate folder. They're not on my path because they'd all interfere. So that's why I'm importing them deliberately so I can get rid of them as we go step through. They follow the standard module. Um, they use the standard module tools, all of the get commands and things work with them. And as I said, you get the freebies uh, around the sim session and whatnot. And to use it, just a standard nice commandlet that you saw. Okay. Uh, question, when you use CDXML uh, modules, yeah. Can, can you do like uh, you do other models, you have a initiation script? So you could, for example, set those uh, constants with HKLM and so on. I'm just going to cover how to cover that in the next demo. Okay, sorry. No, that's but fine. But then you're on the right track. So. Have a, <laughs> that's a great question. Thank have you. a book. <laughs> if anybody else wants a book, you'll have to come to my talk tomorrow. Yeah, that's, that's the, the next step I wanted to cover is exactly the point that the gentleman raised in that that's all great, but you've still got to remember that number. It'd be much nicer just to be able to put HKLM or whatever you want. So let's have a look at how we do that. And let's have a look at the code. And the trick there is I'm just going to come back to the registry one module that we've seen. And what I want you to <coughs> notice is hdef key and a PS type of unsigned integer 32. What I've done HDEF key, PS type, RSPSNA, registry. Hi, anybody recognize that, that .NET class? Is that to remote run spaces? Pardon? Remote run spaces? No. 
It means Richard Sidaway, PS, <laughs> North America, or PowerShell Summit, North America, registry. Hi. What it's doing, so you change the type, and what you do is down at the bottom of your XML, and this is the only real change in here, is that you create an enum. Everybody know what an, an enum, an enumeration is? It's a small .NET construct that allows you to hold a fixed set of values that you can call from it. And all you do is in there, give it the name, give it the underlying type, which is an unsigned integer, and you give it some names and some values, and then you can use it. The important thing, if you're using this uh, for anything with CDXML, is in the name, do not put a space and just use the standard characters. If you use weird characters, it will go bleh on you and it will not play. The other thing to notice is that you can have multiple ways of defining the same value. So I've got HKLM because I'm lazy and I don't like to do a lot of typing. And you can also define the full name as HK Local Machine. And if you look at those two, they should be the same value. They better be the same value, otherwise it won't work. And that's how you go from the int big integer value that nobody can ever remember to something nice and small that everybody can remember. And that question was not planted, honestly. <laughs> that was spontaneous. So we'll load that up and we'll just make sure we got our things ready. And then all you do is give it the HKLM rather than the, the value, the, the numeric value. Uh, it's automatically validated. Has anybody uh, not seen the validate set option on advanced functions where you give the parameter a set of values and it can only use that set of values? Works in exactly the same way. So if you try to use HKLL, for instance, as an um, example, it will give you the standard error message that says, go away, I'm not using that because it's not one of the values that I accept. And as it nicely does, it gives you the, the set of values that you're allowed. If you notice, uh, it actually only gives HKLM, it doesn't give the alias for it, which is interesting. I haven't spotted that before. Uh, defaults to HKLM because that's the lowest numeric value. And if you go. So there wasn't any way to say a default in that enumeration you did? No, it defaults to the, it, like all, like most enumerations, and especially in this, it defaults to the first numeric value. Does those also work with tab completion when you specify them in the, like in new? Yeah. Okay. It, by the time you've got it loaded, it's just a standard. Yeah. Uh, it works in exactly the way as a script commandlet does. Um, Time's pressing, so I'll just whip through this quickly. You can make a parameter mandatory, and you just need to add this line of XML. Is mandatory equals true? If you think of the parameter definition and the attributes, mandatory equals true. These are all very, very similar uh, constructs. And I won't show you the code because they're all, uh, it's just adding that. And you can use it as before, and if you leave the parameter out, it does exactly what you expect and asks for the hive. If you don't give it one, it throws an error. It won't allow a missing value, and so on and so on. So you can start to build in exactly the same validation and exactly the same error handling and issues and uh, safety features and ease of use features that you've got with the ordinary script modules.
And you can also do things like validate not null or empty, which I'll, again, that is, uh, show you that in four. And it's a simple, yeah, where are we? There. Couldn't, couldn't be simpler as a piece of XML. <coughs> and it works as you would expect. And it starts to throw errors because it's expecting uh, a value rather than a null value or an empty value and so on and so on and if you miss the value name off completely it just does nothing because it doesn't understand what you're trying to do see what i mean about a return value of zero when it, uh, non zero when it goes wrong right the just about finished the final demo is before that i'll just show you what the final module looks like this is why I didn't start with this, because there's a lot of it by the time you build all of the other uh, things in. So you can work with the keys and value management. I'm just going to scroll down this fairly quickly. And what I really want you to pick up on is the patterns. So you've got the verb and the noun. You've got the method name. You've got the parameters. And it's a pattern that just repeat. Sorry. It's a pattern that just repeats and repeats and repeats. And this is why using cut and paste works with this, because it's just minor changes. This class is really nice to work with because all of the, class, all of the methods have very, very similar parameters. If you're working with some of the other things like the, the disk classes or whatever, it does get a bit messier, but it follows the same sort of pattern. And there'd be an example of working with, I think it's logical disk, uh, in the download code that goes with it. Anyway, that's just builds up and builds up and builds up following the same pattern. Question? Uh, is there good documentation uh, or have you looked at the Microsoft okay. implementation on it? Uh, there's, what done? there's two. There is a white paper yeah. which I will include with the yeah. download. Um, it is available on the Microsoft site last time I looked. Yeah. Um, that is quite good. Um, but the other good way of doing it is to actually look to see what Microsoft yeah. have done. Uh, and some of the things that I've figured out, I've actually done by looking in their code. Yeah. As with any of the PowerShell modules, please be very, very careful. Do not make changes because a lot of the files are signed. If you make changes to a signed file, what happens? It stops working. Exactly. Right. So... So we looked at that, we'll load the module, and you've got all of the, um, <coughs> most of the methods uh, as functions, and that's the PowerShell script that is generated by this. So I'll just quickly scroll back up. And blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of that. Um, you can have a look at that yourselves if you're interested. Uh, it actually worth going through some of these. There's some good tricks in here that are worth picking up. But notice that it's asking for an external help file. So was there a question? Yeah, I'll wait. Go ahead. Okay. And you can get. I'm just going to run through some of the commandlets out of here uh, quickly. So you can uh, get registry values. <laughs> that, this is an interesting one because it returns the names and the types as two separate collections. I haven't found a way to actually combine these within the XML. So you end up having to do get the, the types and then just do a brute force join on them, which is 
painful, but it works. Uh, D words, just standard numerics. And uh, multi strings, that's a multi valued string. And we'll just show you how to change that. You know that trick for dropping things out of a out of a, an array? Use where and not include something. Came out of Lee Holmes' cookbook. That's another good book. If you've not got it, it's a book I would recommend. And what else have we got? Binaries. Yeah, I'll just whip through this again. These all work in the, exactly the same way. Binary returns a a collection as well so you can add something to it and then push it back in see we've added the value and that ladies and gentlemen is how you create a bunch of commandlets for the registry thank you Thank you. Any questions?